The media of Azerbaijan has recently reported that India sent a large shipment of weapons into Armenia via Iran. And this shipment of weapons possibly included the Pinaka multi-launch rocket system, which is a very powerful and effective uh, weapons system. And the government of Azerbaijan has lodged a strong diplomatic protest with the government of India and the media has gone on an offensive against India. So the question is, why has India chosen to get involved in the Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict at this point in time? How long has India been involved in this matter and what is India trying to achieve? Is India trying to send a message to somebody? Is this message intended for the US or for Turkey or for Pakistan or for somebody else? What is India's geopolitical game plan in all of this? Please subscribe and let's find out. So to understand what's happening here, we have to first of all understand the geography of the region and also the history of the region. So if we look at a map of this region, we find that Armenia is a small nation in located in the Caucasus region. To its east, you have Azerbaijan, its arch enemy. To the east of Azerbaijan, you have the Caspian Sea. If you cross the Caspian Sea, you get the nation of Turkmenistan, which is a Turkic nation. And further north, you have other nations like Kazakhstan and so on. You have Uzbekistan also in the region and so on. Uh, to the north of uh, Armenia, you have Georgia, to the south, uh, to the southwest, you have Anatolia, which is Turkey, to the southeast, you have uh, Iran as well, and there's a small enclave which belongs to now, which now belongs to Azerbaijan, which is also to the southwest of Armenia. And this is something that uh, happened as a consequence of the 2020, 2020 Armenia Azerbaijan a war which lasted about 44 days. So Armenia is kind of a small nation in a very tight spot. Uh, on the one hand, its, its large neighbor is, is Turkey, which is a very hostile nation. On the other hand, you have Azerbaijan and there is also a, a, a border, a shared border, common border with Iran. Now, uh, Azerbaijan is a Turkic nation. They speak a Turkic language, the Azeri language. About 99% of the population of Azerbaijan is Muslim and about 85% of the Muslims are Shia Muslims. They practice Shia Islam. Turkey, which is Azerbaijan's uh, closest ally, Azerbaijan is kind of an extension of Turkey or a vassal or a puppet of Turkey. Well, Turkey is a Sunni Muslim nation and Iran is a Shia Muslim nation. So that's the, the religious angle over here. Armenia is a Christian nation. It's possibly the world's oldest Christian nation or kingdom. It's existed for at least two and a half thousand years, maybe close to three thousand years. Uh, now, now, the history of the Turks is that the Turks intruded into this region in the, in, the, in the first half of the second millennium AD. And they made inroads slowly over time and eventually they, they conquered Constantinople in 1453, if I'm not mistaken, which is, which is the fall of the uh, Byzantine Empire. And that's the, uh, that's, the, that's the origin of the Ottoman Empire and eventually of the modern nation state of Turkey, which uh, came into existence at the end of the Second World War and the Turkish uh, War of Independence, which was won by Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. Long story, uh, if you look at the, the history of Armenia and Turkey and the relations, you see a very uh, difficult relationship. The Turks, the Ottoman Empire indulged, uh, uh, conducted what's called the Armenian Genocide. Uh, it's, it was a wave of, of genocides, not just a single one-time event. It's something that began in the last quarter of the 19th century and it went on all the way into the Second World War. Uh, the last uh, of these events were, were conducted by the by the young Turks triumvirate of uh, Anwar, Talat and Jamal, the three Pashas. Um, so the Armenians have suffered greatly at the hands of the Turks. Um, then later on with the advent of the USSR, both Armenia and Azerbaijan became part of the Soviet Union. Uh, and now we fast forward to the, 19, uh, to the 1980s, late 1980s, when it became apparent that the USSR was going to disintegrate. It eventually became inevitable. And that's where the old rivalry between Armenia and Azerbaijan came back to the fore. And there was the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, which, uh, was, about, which was about the uh, who would take possession of the Artasakh or Nagorno-Karabakh region. Initially, in the 1990s, the Armenians came out on top and they uh, took over the region. But we have to understand that uh, a thousand years ago, there was no uh, Azerbaijan, there was no Turkey. This entire region was, the Caucasus region was mainly Georgian and Armenian. 
So what is currently called Azerbaijan was once Armenian territory, which was then taken over by force by the Turks. It was conquered and occupied by the Turks. Similarly, what's currently Turkey was once an extension of Greece. Anatolia was entirely Greek. So Turkey is a new phenomenon. It's a new, it's a new uh, na nation state. It's a new culture. It, it did not originally exist here. It's something that happened through conquest. And the same goes for Azerbaijan. So, uh, so that, that's the deal. So in the 1990s, the Armenians were able to hold on to the territory of Nagorno-Karabakh through military action. And then if you fast forward, it, uh, fast forward history into the 2010s, then in the second half of the 2010s, in the decade of the 2010s, you had uh, a resurgence of the conflict and the Turks were able to arm uh, and support Azerbaijan. And in 2020, in the second half of 2020, I think in September, October, around that time, November of 2020, we had the second Nagorno-Karabakh war in which uh, the Azerbaijanis, the Azeris were able to come out on top and they were able to capture significant uh, portions of Armenian held territory. Uh, they were aided uh, greatly by the Turks. The Turks, it is alleged, even sent some Syrian fighters and ISIS fighters uh, to, to help uh, Azerbaijan. And one of the surprising allies of Azerbaijan in this conflict happened to be Israel, the nation of Israel. Now, it's, it's kind of perplexing at first glance, kind of strange uh, that that Israel would support an ally of Turkey in, in a war against a Christian nation, kind of strange. And you also found that Iran was on the side of Armenia, uh, you know, Iran supporting a Christian nation, very strange coalition and very strange bedfellows, but that's what happened. And to understand why it happened, we have to understand the logic of strategy. So let's understand the point of views, the perspectives of each of these individual actors. First of all, we have Armenia, which is the weakest nation in all this, and it's currently uh, the, 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 the one that's suffering, the one that is currently the victim because its territory is under attack, it's been taken over, parts of its territory have been taken over and so forth. Uh, let's take a look at Turkey. What does Turkey seek? So first of all, we have to understand Turkey is a member of NATO. It's a member of NATO. It's an ally of the US. It hosts US nuclear weapons on its territory, which, which technically makes it a US vassal state from that perspective, right? So Turkey and the US are allies, clearly allies. Okay, Turkey has certain uh, geopolitical and, Im and imperial ambitions of its own, which it kind of holds in abeyance for now. So Turkey is a US ally and Turkey is an ally or Turkey is essentially the master of Azerbaijan, which tells us that Azerbaijan is also pro-US. We know that Israel is essentially an extension of the US in a, in a great number of ways. Israel would not exist were it not for the US and the support the US gave it over the past many decades uh, since the creation of Israel. So Israel essentially is a US puppet. Um, it's, it's, uh, let's call it a US ally. So Turkey, Israel, Azerbaijan, are US allies. Uh, north of Armenia, you have Georgia, which fears Russia and is also very strongly pro-West. So once again, you have what you could call a US ally over here, north of Armenia. Now, let's uh, look at the world through uh, Mackinder's perspective. So, you know, the world island and the heartland and rimland theory. From that perspective, India and China are rimland powers, whereas Russia is a heartland power. And whoever controls the heartland controls the world island or the entire world. So the key to controlling the world is to control Russia. And that's why the US would very much like to control Russia. And according to this theory, the pivot area or the key to controlling Russia is Eastern Europe which essentially is Ukraine, and that explains the Ukraine conflict. So north of the Black Sea, you have Crimea, and you have the Ukraine war that's going on over here, uh, over there. And uh, right now, the US and, and NATO are kind of on the back foot. Uh, they have not succeeded in you know, driving Russia out of Ukraine. And the Russians are kind of uh, doing better overall as of today. Some people would disagree, that's fine. But that's how I see it, okay? So you have the Ukraine war going on over there. And if Ukraine fails, Ukraine is just a proxy of the US. It's a disposable asset. If Ukraine fa fails, the US will press Poland into service and preparations are already going on for that to happen.
right? And uh, eventually Ukraine may be, get bifurcated, it may, you know, be broken up, some part of it may be absorbed by Poland, and then Poland could continue the good fight on behalf of the US against Russia, that's something that could happen. So the US would like to control Eastern Europe to get access to the heartland of the world island. They want to control the high heartland and they want to control Russia. Eventually, that's a long-term uh, great dream or great uh, great uh, game plan. Another way of get getting access to the heartland is via the Caucasus. The US already, you could say, controls Turkey. Turkey is their ally. They can uh, station their forces in on Turkish territory. Through Turkey, if they could get access to the Caspian Sea, that would create, uh, you know, that would really uh, move this uh, entire process forward. But there is a big impediment in connecting Turkey to Azerbaijan and that impediment is the little nation of Armenia. So Turkey wants to create a great trans-Turan corridor, pan-Turan corridor, whatever they call it, which essentially means that Armenia must be erased from the map of the world. Armenia must cease to exist and it should be gobbled up by either Azerbaijan or by Turkey and uh, they can uh, they can essentially uh, conclude what they could not conclude in 1915 or something like that right so they would like to erase Armenia from the map of the, of the world and that dovetails perfectly with what the US would like so if they achieve this if they achieve uh, if they succeed in erasing Armenia from the map of the world connecting Turkey to Azerbaijan then they could move further east and bring Turkmenistan on their side. Turkmenistan is very much a Turkic nation and eventually Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Uzbek, not Tajikistan, but Uzbekistan and so on may also be maneuvered into that sort of a geopolitical embrace, possibly. That's something that could eventually poss possibly be done. So the impediment is Armenia and, and, and that's that's what they would like to uh, get rid of. So that is what this entire conflict is about. Now there is another actor over here, which is Iran. Iran, as we know, uh, seeks to erase Israel from the map of the world. And the US has ensured that, I that Iran is its, uh, you know, its major enemy. I mean, from Iran's perspective, the greatest threat it, 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 it has in the world, it comes from two nations, which is one, the US and second, Israel. So Iran is very much anti-US, anti-Israel, and Israel has conducted various operations against Iran in the past. They've destroyed a nuclear reactor under construction once in the 1980s, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the Osirak reactor, was it? I think it was Iran, Iraq. Okay, they have conducted various uh, operations against Iran. Uh, the Stuxnet virus is something the US did against Iran to sabotage its nuclear program, and that's a long history behind that. So Iran would very much like to see Turkey's great objective of this pan-Turan corridor not fructify. It is in Iran's interest to have Armenia keep on existing and it should, you know, it should stay independent and secure and a sovereign nation. The other reason is that if you look at the northwest portion of Iran, the northwest quarter of Iran, that's two provinces, which is East and West Azerbaijan, but Iranian Azerbaijan. And the people there are ethnic Azerbaijanis, ethnic Azeris who speak the Azeri language. Now, overall, we think of Iran or Persia as, a, well, historically, they, they called themselves the Arya people. There are two Arya nations in the world, which is which are India and Iran. These are the only two nations whose people can legitimately identify themselves as the Arya people. Right, the Indo-Iranian people, uh, but if you look at the ethnic make makeup of Iran, about a quarter of Iran's population is ethnic Azeris, and these people reside in the northwest of the region, which is kind of quite quite close to Tehran. So, from Israel's perspective, it has good relations with Azerbaijan, and about a quarter of Iran's population in the northwest, adjoining Azerbaijan, is people who are ethnic Azeris. So Iran has a great, one of the world's best uh, spy agencies, the Mossad, right? And they would very much like to utilize this population, you know, infiltrate the population, get, make inroads into the population, uh, convert them into spies and all, to try and infiltrate Iran and create all kinds of trouble for Iran in the long run, mayhem for Iran. And that is something Iran is very acutely conscious of. And that's why they would like to see uh, Armenia remain stable and secure and independent 
and uh, unmolested. So there's a big geopolitical game afoot over here. So Iran feels a lot of pressure from what's happening in the Caucasus region. If uh, Turkey succeeds, then it's it's a disaster for Iran. If Armenia goes out of existence, then it's like uh, you know a very strongly advantage NATO advantage Israel advantage US. So Iran would not like Armenia to disappear and that's why they have been on the side of Armenia, they've been supporting Armenia and now recently there's been, uh, India has got involved in this. Uh, the past two, three years India has uh, inked several weapons deals with Armenia to the tune of approximately half a billion dollars, which is a very non-trivial sum of money. Half a billion is a lot is a lot of money, especially for a small nation like Armenia. So India has sold Armenia a bunch of uh, Swati radars. Uh, these radar radars uh, are capable of uh, detecting incoming artillery at about a 50 kilometer or so range, if I am not mistaken, and they are superior to other. Uh, radars, Russian radars and Polish radars of a similar caliber, so of a similar make. So the Swati radars are excellent and that's what India has, had initially sold to Armenia and then India has sold artillery pieces to Armenia and the Pinaka multi-launch barrel system and ammunition and perhaps other things as well. So it's roughly a half billion dollars worth of uh, weapon systems that India is selling to Armenia and this latest shipment is most likely something that was part of that. And this shipment happened through Iran. So it most likely entered, reached Iran at the port of Bandar Abbas. Then it was transported either by rail or by road across the length of Iran. And then it crossed over into Armenia and it was delivered to the Armenian military. So India has been involved in this for at least two or three years. Uh, Israel has been supporting, like I said, Azerbaijan. They supplied Azerbaijan with various weapon systems, drones, loitering munitions that kind of turned the tide in Azerbaijan's favor in the 2020 uh, Nagorno-Karabakh war, which Azerbaijan prevailed in. And India is supporting the other side, Armenia. So even though most people see Iran, uh, see India and Israel as great allies and the best of friends, like they say, we are on opposite sides in this conflict. And that doesn't mean that India and Israel are enemies. India and Israel have so much in common, lots of geo geopolitical uh, areas of convergence. So this is something that can be, you know, uh, uh, sidestepped. It's not a big deal as far as the broader relationship is con concerned. But in this particular thing, India and Israel are on opposite sides, are on two enemy sides. That's, that's how it is going. So the question is, why is India taking sides in this conflict. Isn't this something India should stay out of? Isn't India supposed to be non-aligned and all that? So what's happening here? So we have to understand that India, uh, if we have to understand the, the outlook of Turkey and Azerbaijan vis-a-vis -vis India, we have to understand the security and stability of this region and what it means for India. So India has something called the North uh, International North-South Transport Corridor, which uh, which we are part of, which essentially is a freight transshipment uh, uh, route, which starts from Mumbai. It, uh, from Mumbai, you will you will have uh, ships that go to Bandar Abbas with cargo. Then the cargo will be transported via Iran, either into Azerbaijan or into Armenia, and from there it will go into Russia. And from Russia, it will be it will go to other parts of Europe, and there's a Mediterranean route as well. Uh, through through Suez, if I'm not mistaken, and through the Red Sea and Suez and all that. So it's the International North-South Transport Corridor that India is part of. And if, if, if this entire region north of Iran is controlled by Turkey, it kind of places India in a bind because Turkey is a hostile nation. Turkey is very strongly anti-India and pro-Pakistan. Turkey has made lots of statements against India. Turkey has officially put its weight behind Pakistan when it comes to the imaginary Kashmir conflict. And overall, it's a hostile nation for India. Uh, if you look at the relationship between the, the two leaders, Mr. Modi and Mr. Erdogan, they clearly have a reasonably good relationship. They are quite friendly with each other. But the two nations are on opposite sides of the geopolitical divide. That's how it goes. Personal, personal relationships don't matter in, in geopolitics. You can be good friends, but you may be on opposite sides. So uh, Turkey is a very hostile nation and Ar Azerbaijan as an extension of Turkey is an equally hostile nation when it comes to India. So if Turkey wipes out Armenia from the map and takes over the entire region, they can create trouble for India. They can cut off India's access 
to Europe to, to Europe and cut off India's access at that, that part of in, in India's role in the international north-south transport corridor. So India would like to have options over here, Armenia as well as Azerbaijan. We could you know transship our goods via Armenia or via Azerbaijan. So having this nation safe over there, Armenia gives us options and selling arms and ammunition and aiding them gives us leverage in negotiating with not just Turkey and Azerbaijan but also with nations like Israel and with nations like the United States because after all behind all this is the US like I said the the, the Mackinder uh, Heartland Rimland thing uh, the, the US is, is a very strong believer in that and they would like to make inroads either via Eastern Europe through Ukraine or Poland into the Russian heartland or from the Caucasus region. So they are trying two different uh, approaches. Uh, so if we have a say and if we, uh, we are actively involved in this matter, then this gives India uh, leverage in negotiations. So that is the reason why India is involved in this. So what are the other nations doing here? So Iran would very much like Armenia to continue to exist and stay safe and secure and independent and sovereign. So India and Iran have a convergence of interest over here. So that's why India and Iran are working together. Russia also would like Armenia to continue existing. Russia uh, don't, doesn't want to see Turkey and NATO make further inroads than what they already have in this region. Georgia could become part of NATO or, or de facto part of NATO if this uh, this uh, trans turan corridor is created so that would be another uh, huge problem for russia possibly at the same scale as what the ukraine ukraine issue is so that is something russia would not like to see happen and china also is indirectly involved because china is on the side of russia and iran even though it's very strongly anti india so it's a very complex uh, game that we are witnessing over here uh, if if turkey succeeds and and armenia gets wiped out, then it's it's a, it's a bad thing for Iran. It's, it could be advantage Israel as well. So it's, like I said, it's a very complicated scenario over here. Uh, so from India's perspective, the reason why India is involved is to ensure that the status quo continues. The status quo will ensure that India has access to, to uh, Europe via the International North-South Transport Corridor and Helping Armenia survive also gives India leverage vis-a-vis -vis Turkey, vis-a-vis -vis Israel, vis-a-vis -vis Iran, vis-a-vis -vis Russia and vis-a-vis -vis the US as well. The more you are involved in geopolitical uh, activities across the world, the more relevant you are and the more leverage you have in diplomacy and negotiations in a variety of, of spheres which may be far removed from the Caucasus region. So that is why India is involved in this and India is doing a good thing because Armenia is a small helpless nation, a nation with which India has had very ancient relations. If you look at the history of Armenia 2000 years ago, this in, the entire Caucasus region was home to various Indianized kingdoms. There were lots of Hindu temples over there. These temples no longer exist. They were they were torn down and replaced by religious structures of other religions, first of all Christianity and later on, much later, those of Islam, the, the standard process that we are all quite familiar with. But um, the Turks, if you look at their social media uh, pronouncements and all that, they kind of seem to regard Armenia, the people of Armenia, as possibly related to the people of India or maybe descended from ancient Indians. That's how the Turks see the Armenians and the Turks have for some reason, some kind of hatred towards India and the same hatred they feel towards Armenia as well. So there is this uh, blood enmity of, kind, of, of, of some kind that the Turks have with Armenia. And you will see that uh, if, if somebody mentions the Armenian genocide, the Turks get really upset about this. They don't want this to be recognized. They don't want anyone to speak about this. But their politicians miss no chance to remind the Armenians of what they did to them. And they keep saying that, be careful, someday... In the middle of the night, we're going to come back and, and finish the job. So that's the kind of approach uh, and attitude the Turks have towards Armenia. They see Armenia as a piece of unfinished business and they would like very much to wipe it off the map of the world. And it is in India's interest that Armenia continues to exist because it uh, makes the place more stable and it uh, maintains the status quo and gives India and the world more options. And it's a beautiful ancient culture, a beautiful ancient kingdom that deserves to survive. 
So that is uh, the situation over here. That's why India is involved in this. And uh, uh, India may further uh, send more arms and ammunition to Armenia in case it is required. So that is the situation as of now. It's a complex, fast-changing geopolitical scenario that we're witnessing right now. And things could change further. I hope there is no more war in the region. There have already been two Nagorno-Karabakh wars. I hope there's no more warfare. And one of the ways of maintaining peace is peace through strength. It's not one of the ways, it's the only way. You can only maintain peace through strength. You can never have peace through weakness. The moment you're weak compared to your opponent, they're going to finish the job. So that's why India is ensuring that Armenia remains uh, reasonably well armed and that way it can continue surviving and that way there will be peace in the Caucasus region and that serves not only India's interest but the interest of other nations that uh, in some way or the other are in some ways, uh, you could say, allied with India to a certain extent. So that is the situation as of today. Thank you for watching and I will see you very soon.